Welcome to the Seahawkers Podcast with your host, Adam Emmert. I don't know about this pseudo real fake grass. And Brandon Schultz. This should be unanimous. The robocalls are out of control. Go Hawks! This is episode 222 of the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers, and joining me, my good buddy, Adam Emmer. My man, Brandon Schultz. How are you, bud? Dude, I am fired up. It is, by the time this launches, Adam, you are going to be just packing your bags, getting on the mm-hmm. road, picking me up in Kalispell, and we're heading to Canada to catch our flight to London. Absolutely. I have... Not been outside of the U.S. since I was probably, I don't know, 10. And I'll see Canada and England all in uh, one trip. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. You you live within an hour and a half of the border and you haven't crossed it since you were 10 years old. So back when I was 10 years old, guess what? You didn't need to go to Canada. Yeah. A passport or Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then they changed that rule and then I just didn't go. And, hmm. But now I have a passport. This <laughs> this trip has forced me to get a passport. That's good in case I ever need to escape the country. Uh, because if uh, the Rams continue to, to win games and go undefeated, I may have to escape the country. But I don't <laughs> think that's going to happen. We do have some thoughts on the Rams, of course, with the Seahawks taking the 33 to 31 loss this week. And we're going to talk about where to place the blame, coaching versus execution more positivity about the offensive line in the show. And with the Oakland game coming up, you can find out, you can come hang out with us if you want. And we're going to tell you how to do that a little later on in the show. I am so stoked to meet so many of you listeners, you little flockers, people that uh, have been on my radar for a long time. It's going to be an absolute blast. Can't wait. Well, let's get into the game with the Rams. Uh, we got some of Clinton's thoughts in the post game reaction show, and and we're waiting. I'm sure there's so many, so many of our listeners, Adam, who are waiting to hear from you in this game. And I think our mantra of winning is better than losing. I think that was tested a little bit this week because after the win against the Arizona Cardinals and after the loss to the Los Angeles Rams, I feel distinctly different ways. In either case, is winning better than losing? Well, (laughs) yes, because if we would have won against the Rams, that would have been better than losing. Still. So if we would have lost to the Cardinals, it would have been it would have been worse than winning. Yeah. Even though opposite world feels like it's in full effect this last two weeks, because, yes, I think we all felt far more down about the team after the Arizona Cardinals game. And I don't know. I haven't listened to. To you and in, in Clinton's post game show or any national stuff, I, I haven't listened to crap of what anybody had to say about this game because I wanted to keep my own opinion about this to to bring to you guys without it being really uh, skewed by anybody else. But let's first, I want to thank uh, Clinton for coming on and uh, filling in in the post game show for me. The man, the myth, the legend, creator of three and three out. If you haven't been watching those uh, amazing vlogs on the Seahawkers podcast YouTube channel, then you're missing out. So go check that out. Check out uh, what Clinton does. It's amazing. But I don't know about you, Brandon, but this is the game that I watched. And at the end of it, I was like, we're back. Really? Okay. Because yeah. some of our, some of our listeners didn't feel quite the same way. Michael in San Diego says moral victories don't feel as good as Catfish. he wins. And I don't know if I agree with that. I I think losing by two to the Rams, there's a lot of positive things to take away. Whereas in that win against the Cardinals, it it had me feeling a little bit more down. But because we did take the loss, I think it's important to get out of the way real quick here. The reason why we lost. And it wasn't the Seahawks. It wasn't execution. It wasn't coaching. uh, It was Angela Kosky Earl who says, well, she knows what she did. Let me just simultaneously answer the last question for you and take full responsibility for this loss. It's fourth and one. And the punt unit comes out right after I had turned to my family and said, yeah, he'll go for it on fourth and one. Why the hell wouldn't you? Then what the hell? Why aren't they going for it? They'll make one freaking yard. We we would go for it. And then, oh, and then my hawker comes crashing down around me. My thoughts were sent instantaneously to Rams. Rams dipped head. And lo and behold, a change was made and the offense came out 
So I'm sorry. I thought my hawker was in alignment, and obviously it was not. Yeah, you got to be careful what you speak into reality, right? Way that uh, there's that thing where you, if you say something, it manifests itself in the real world, and that you, this you is can jinx it. Yeah, this is what happened here. You know, as much as we might celebrate the fact that the Seahawks finally look like they are finding their identity on offense, they didn't do what Pete Carroll always preaches in games like this, and that's to finish. Because the Seahawks, they had the lead going into the fourth quarter. They were up in the game, had the lead at home in the fourth quarter, and they couldn't finish. And there were three plays that I think this game hinged on in the fourth quarter. You had the fourth and two. You got the Rams. You stopped them on third down inside the 10-yard line. They decide to go for it on fourth and down. They pass it out to the outside, and uh, Shaquille Griffin comes in with a pass interference. They end up scoring on the next play, and fortunately, they miss the extra point, but then it's still, they have the lead. It's 31 to 30. The Seahawks stall out. There was a pass to Vanette, and I don't know if I include this as one of the three plays because Peters made a really good play uh, ahead of Vanette to tip the pass up. He couldn't come down with it. They end up stalling out on that drive. The Rams get the ball back, drive down for a field goal, but then the Seahawks, they respond. And they have a deep pass to Tyler Lockett, 44 yards down the middle. And then we see it all unravel. And, and Dave Bloomquist points us out first and 10 at the 32 with four and a half minutes left. They fall start. No, they go, not uh, they. A Fetty. A Fetty. A Fetty false starts. The, the clock was down to zero. They still had two timeouts at that point. I know. That could have been, that could have been a place where you take a timeout before the clock hits zero. Really? But, no way. But a Fetty false starts. Then there's a two yard run with a holding penalty. Holding penalty on Fluker. Then incomplete pass that's batted away. And then an incomplete pass where there's a scramble and a throwaway. And Dave points out that, my friend, is a lack of execution with the game on the line. The false start was the most brutal just because that automatically now pushes you back and everybody. And their dog knows you're throwing the ball at this point, even though they did try to run it and, you know, gained a, a whopping two. But the holding call on Fluker was legit. I know Fluker didn't like it. I know Pete Carroll didn't like it, but that's a hold. And that needs to be called. And I think the argue, the, the reason why Pete was so upset about it, it wasn't that it was called necessarily. It's that it wasn't called consistently throughout the game. And the decision to call it there seemed, you know, questionable. Yeah, good luck calling a holding consistently throughout the game. I mean, the old adage is that you can call holding on any play throughout a game, which which is true. Reginald James says after watching the DVR recording, uh, I think Adam's on to something with the NFL helping the Rams out in that game. (laughs) That holding call was bullshit. So, look, I, I understand the sentiment and the timing of it was especially brutal in it really is a bummer that that was on Fluker considering how well he played throughout this game. He's a difference maker on that offensive line, man. I am so excited to have him out there playing guard. It's really helped a Fetty for the most part. He still can, you know, reel off a terrible penalty at the worst possible time. We saw it in this game, but we did see the offense throughout the game be able to run the ball on quote unquote, the best defense in all of football. With the guys, Sue and Donald up front, people who in Brockers, people who are unmovable, right? Yeah. They, they, you cannot run the football on them. I watched the Vikings try to run on them, couldn't get squat done, and we jellied it down their throats. That right there, that was the moment when I was like, holy crap, we've, we've actually got something here. Because this is, this is the third week in a row that they've actually been able to run the football and run it really, really well. Once is a coincidence, twice is a trend, three times is a you problem. In this case, three times is a is a you success. This is great. <laughs> and it makes all the difference in the world with Russell Wilson in the passing game. My only critique of the of the running game would be I want to see Russell keep it more. I I know that there are people saying that he has a hamstring injury that has not been confirmed, but he's still able to run around enough. And if we just let him keep it a few times on some of these read option looks. Just make the defense respect it just a little bit more. That run game when he does hand it off to Carson or Davis would be even more explosive. So I, that's something I would like to see and didn't see. But 
you talked about three plays that uh, were kind of the difference in the game. I feel like this was one of those games that you weren't going to win because you're going to need the ball to bounce your way a few times. And boy, howdy, did the ball just bounce the Rams way throughout the entire game, starting with Frank Clark's strip sack of Jared Goff that bounces directly back into his hands. Goff waits the snap, a four-man rush. Goff steps up, ball is slapped away. Goff picks it up, flag is down, throw is dropped out near the 50-yard line. Frank Clark was coming. He got a hand on that pass. There is no foul play. There is no foul play. Fourth down. It is a fourth down, a three and out. Only the third time all season, and Frank Clark was a man who was not going to be denied. There was a strip sack later in the game in which the ball bounced right underneath an offensive lineman. They were able to recover. There was a pass, I believe, in the second quarter where he went for one of the wide receivers, Goff did, bounces off the receiver, and Tyler Higby, the tight end, <laughs> just it. right, right, right. These are the things. These are the, these are the little things that, like, you understood the football gods were just against you a little bit. Yeah, they, but they did have some, I mean, they did have a couple turnovers in this game. Let's talk a little bit about the strip sack that wasn't a sack because I, I found out something interesting. If the quarterback fumbles the ball, like Frank Clark knocked it out of his mm-hmm. hands. If the quarterback's able to pick it back up and attempt to pass, it's not a sack. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's why you, why, that's why in the, you look in the box score. Yeah. Jared Goff only sacked one time and it doesn't have any Seahawks player listed as, as having a sack. Although I, I think they did give one to Quentin Jefferson because if you remember the moment where Jared Goff steps up in the pocket and he just loses the football out of his hand. Yeah. That was that was the one sack that counted. Interesting. Well, I you break out the NBC the more you know music, right? <laughs> because yeah, I, if you I can attempt to pass after fumbling it and recovering it, then it's not know. a sack. I didn't know. Thank you. Thank you for the public service announcement. That's yeah, you bet. That's great, Brandon. Well, you didn't let me finish my three plays because I, oh, I thought I, we I, did. I'm sorry. No, Jeez. Well, I I had I had I, did, I confused things a little bit. That's my fault. Well, I'm confused now. Then <laughs> are you guys confused? Nod right now if you're confused. Tim. Nod right now if you're confused. No, the the third play that the that the in the fourth quarter that the game hinged on was that fourth and inches where the Rams decided to go for it and couldn't get the stop. Because they they did stop him on third down. Tedrick Thompson came in the hole and Amazing. absolutely hammered Todd Todd Gurley in the hole to keep him from getting the first down. And all you have to do in that situation on fourth and inches is is stop him, and then you have the ball on your side of the of the field with a minute and a half left. Sure, and not saying that. I mean, that's it's kind of a high probability play for the Rams to go for it on yes. fourth and inches. I understand. Yeah, not, not, not just go for it, but to get it. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is kind of lean forward a little bit. Exactly. The QB sneak is unbelievably effective in those situations. I don't care what team you are. It's almost impossible to stop. This is where I felt like Pete got caught up in <sighs> coach think instead of, instead of understanding the flow of the game. Because I I thought Angela's uh, email hit this right on the head. As a Seahawks fan, when they trotted out the punter, weren't you excited to see Johnny Hecker? I was. I was thinking about. I was thinking about the potential fake. They've done that before to us. Well, maybe. Okay, fine. But they were going to punt the football. Like that was happening, and the play clock was running down. So I don't understand for the life of me why you call time out there. Let me ask you this, Brandon. If I had told you going into this game that with a buck oh five left, you'd get the ball somewhere around the 20. Russell Wilson uh, has a minute five and a timeout and you're down two. Would you take that? I would. Okay. I would. And so if if that's the case, so if that's the case, which I mean, me too. When Johnny Hecker comes trotting out on the field, you, I'm like, yes, this is exactly what I want. I don't want to see the offense come back out. But Pete calls a timeout, gives McVay a second to think about it, and go, oh, okay, all we have to do is sneak this and salt the game away. And you're like, well, if we stop them, then you you get the ball with more time. Well, the odds of you stopping them are so uh, minute that saving the 30 seconds doesn't really matter. 
let let Sean if if Sean McVay needs more time to make that decision, let him call the timeout, and you save uh, uh, your one remaining timeout. Yeah, and if well, they you were stop out of timeouts him, at that point, th- well, there you go. <laughs> so, like to me, that was an abomination, and it was just because Pete got caught up in thinking about the clock rather than thinking about the moment. We talk about situational football all the time. That's a situational football play. Now, am I mad at Pete about that? No, I, because that's a mistake almost every coach in this league will make at some point or another. Clock management is terrible when it comes to NFL coaching for whatever reason. I I, I don't know what it is, but I think they overthink themselves. Well, I do, and maybe they don't think about it enough is the problem. Maybe they just think more time is better than a timeout. And in that situation, that because Pete had already called the timeout before they came out to measure it, they then they decide to come out to measure it. So they say, yeah, do you still want to take your timeout or or do you want to keep it? And he says, no, I want to take it. And and then that's what gives the Rams extra time to make that decision. Yeah, I'm more of the opinion that it's inconsequential because you have to one, you either have to stop him on the fourth and one or you have to drive the length of the field to the point to where you can kick a, a a game winning field goal at the end. Right. Yeah, there, but, there's... With, but with the way the defense had been playing that whole second half and the way the offense had been playing the whole game, which unit do you want to be making the game winning plays in that I think moment? Either, yeah. Either, either one in that moment can make it. Oh, Brandon, come on. Out of the two <laughs> units, the offense done out of the two point? units, in which, the entire, one, the, which one had been effective the throughout the whole had game? The entire fourth quarter to try and make something happen. <laughs> They had two drives. And short, and short of penalties on the last drive, they were doing it. Which unit had been the more effective unit throughout the game? It's a very simple question. Oh, yeah. That, I agree with you. Okay. But it's one play versus having to... It's, it's one play on defense at that point that, where that you is, have to make a That is nearly impossible compared to... We've seen Russell Wilson be the guy since he's come into this league with the most fourth quarter stats. I want it in his hands. I want it in the offense's hands in that yeah. particular moment. Yeah, I, I wanted them to do something on on either of the drives that they had the opportunity in the fourth quarter. So that's why I think that you can't you can't put it all on, no, on the I don't. timeout. I don't put it all on that because but, the defense. You say the offense had uh, two drives there in the fourth quarter to get it done, and then didn't. My my rebuttal to that would be the defense also had every opportunity to make a stop at some point in the second half, but couldn't. Gave up a score on every single drive, except for the final drive, just because the clock expired. Right. All we needed was one stop in the second half. One! And that game is over. We win that game. And they had it. They had it at that moment. If if Shaquille Griffin doesn't get the P.I. on fourth and two, if he... That's tough. Uh, it, it, that's tough. If he's going for the ball rather than the, the, the back of the receiver... It was P.I. He got there oh, early. Absolutely. But, that's what I mean. If he if he's looking if he's looking for the ball rather than just looking at the receiver's back and and planning to hammer it, I think that he sees that it's going to be outside and or or he doesn't get a penalty because he's actually going for the ball rather than the, the you know getting there just a little bit too early. Or if he you know if he's well, that's if the he thing. Times so, it up just a little bit better. Yeah, that that's just a guy gaining experience in this league. I like the idea that. This is something I wanted to get to. I like the idea that Shaq and T2 and Trey Flowers and McDougal and Coleman, all those guys out there are relatively either inexperienced or young. And they are learning on the job now. I understand this is Shaq's second year, but he's still a very young player. I love the idea that A, he had done the film study, B, had the recognition, and C, had the aggressiveness to make that play. Now, in the future... With this experience, he will time those things up better. And that's something I look at with this defense. This young secondary, for the most part, held up about as well as you could hope. I've watched this Rams team torch everybody under the sun while the weather has been nice. And this young secondary, without Earl for the very first time, actually played their hearts out. I am so optimistic about the future of the safety tandem of T2 and McDougal about Trey Flowers and his play in, in Shaq. The only thing I want to see different, I want to see them up at the line of scrimmage more. I'm tired of all this off coverage. Like this is, they got killed and torched 
by playing way too, way too soft throughout the well, course of this game. And I think I think maybe that was part of the game plan because you didn't see them get torch deep. I, I want to read an email real quick from Gavin in Sacramento says, I think more credit for the Rams success should be going to McVeigh than Goff. Uh, almost every throw he made had receivers open by a mile which speaks to the play calling slash schemes as opposed to an elite quarterback picking us apart. Although this new Rams offense really reminds me of the old greatest show on turf Rams from the early two thousands, deep routes with seven step drops and a dynamic rusher as an emergency outlet. But with the added wrinkle of jet sweeps, if memory serves the downfall of that system besides Warner leaving was the inability to deal with pressure. So it will be interesting to see how these guys fare against the Broncos and bears later this year. Also, all this talk about Pete's timeout costing us the game is truly unfair. In those final two minutes, every second counts. And you could not, in good conscience, allow a third of your available time to slip away to save one timeout. And there's no way of knowing if McVeigh would magically grow a pair in the extra 30 seconds he was allotted by calling it. If people want to blame specific plays, it much more came down to Griffin's PI on fourth quarter in the game and our inability to to get back into field goal range following the false start and hold the drive before. In closing, I love the new rushing attack, but hopefully Russell will start to keep a few of those read options to keep the opponents honest. Otherwise, they really don't accomplish what they are designed for. Also, do you feel we should be concerned about the one-catch performance by Baldwin? Thanks for the always entertaining show, and go Hawks. Yeah, go Hawks. We're obviously in agreement with, with the amount of number of points. There is a a valid point that you and Gavin have regarding the timeout. And I get it. That's one way to look at it. I just, just not the way I would have played it. And that's why I think it's more of a, a value judgment, right? Do you value the amount of time on the clock? Because you can throw it down the middle. If you have a a minute 39, which they would have, I I think, or, or a minute 35, you still had time to make throws down the middle. Had they punted, uh, because you can run up and spike it. Or do you value the timeout so you can throw it over the field, uh, throw it down the middle of the field and take a timeout and, and get up the line rather than this is where you're missing the point. I value the ball. What's rule number one? Oh, yeah. It's, it's all, about, all the ball. about the ball. So give me the ball back. <laughs> right. That that to me, like, who cares? It's, it's inconsequential how much time you have if you don't have the ball. <laughs> right. Yeah, and and maybe Carol just doesn't think that McVeigh changes his mind in that particular situation. But I, just, that's why I don't I think, think he was even thinking in that term. I just think he was thinking about the clock. Yeah. And, and, which is, again, I'm not mad at him. I don't think right. he's losing it. I don't think anything <laughs> like that. I just think he outthought himself. Yeah, I, and I, I don't think that's the way I'd put it. I don't think it outthought itself. I, I just I just don't think that he considered it in in that way. I think yeah, I, maybe as, a coach, as a coach, as a coach in it. those final moments, you go, okay, this is what you're supposed to do, rather than kind of just feeling right. it out and uh, in terms of the situation. Yeah, I mean, just everybody, every Seahawks fan in the world wanted them to punt the ball there. Instead okay. of trot the uh, offense out. And and also uh, watching for the fake. Well, sure. But, I mean, I guess we'll never know. But there were some things in here that uh, I want to hit on. The the idea of the Rams' success, you know, the, if that should go to McVay rather than Goff. I mean, Goff, every yes. time he got to the back of his drop back, there was a guy running wide open. Yeah, no, this is very much McVay. And I think Gavin made a good point regarding comps for this offense and going back to the greatest show on turf and yes for a season and a half they were unstoppable for a season and a half yeah and then the league caught on this is going to get exposed at some point i promise you this all these little bunch route uh, bunch formations and rub routes and all that jazz with these very deep late developing routes this will be figured out. And mark my words, when the weather gets cold, this team is going to start losing games because the Rams defense is not as advertised. That back end of their defense is poor. We saw that if you can play physical and bully and bully them around, which is possible, even with Donald Sue and Brockers up front, you can take the starch right out of them. DJ Fluker, Justin Britt, and J.R. Sweezy beat the catfish out of that defensive line. 
And Chris Carson followed up running hard behind his pads. This Rams team is a bit of a mirage. And everybody who can't can't wait to get on one knee because the one knee approach is best for kissing ass. <laughs> like because it puts the booty right in front of your face. Like all these media members that are just kissing the Rams ass. This will come back to bite them. What I loved and why I'm so optimistic after this game is watching a scheme that I know will fail in when the weather gets like crappy. And then I watch our team with all of the young guys, all of the new pieces that we're putting together and finding our identity now for the third week and knowing by week 10, 11, 12, the national narrative about the Seahawks is going to be we're the hottest team in football. Look, we just took the best team, quote unquote, in football down to the wire and lost by two with a young secondary with T2 starting for the first time. No Earl Thomas. I mean, there's no KJ Wright, no Michael yeah. Kendricks. Like there's so much coming down the road here with the offense finally figuring it out that I have a really good feeling about this. There is a lot of room for growth, and I think that's where the optimism is for Seahawks, especially with the, the young guys on defense. You look at the the pro football focus numbers, which I was I, I looked at the defense, and you see that Tedrick Thompson is the top graded defender on the Seahawks defense. No kidding. He he was. Yeah. Interesting. In his in his first full time game. And a mm-hmm. lot of that was due to his coverage ability. I think his ability to you know to make that play on third and short with Todd Gurley. I think he was credited uh, pretty well for that. And I think about how crazy it might be if the Seahawks lose Earl Thomas, lose Cam Chancellor, and they still have the best safety tandem in the NFL. Like that potential is there. Does that speak to Pete Carroll and the way that he can train up a defensive backfield a little bit? Yeah, I'm not ready to move on from Pete Carroll. <laughs> no, me neither. It seemed like a couple a couple weeks ago that was an actual consideration. And oh, I think among, we're going to talk about this 12s. more on, on the okay. bonus show this week because okay. uh, uh, Tim Moon sent in a, a long form essay on why yes. <laughs> why Pete Carroll why he must stay. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can sum it up. Right quick for you. He's the most successful coach in Seattle Seahawks history. And he's a quarter of a way through a, a re- rebuilding year. And it's starting to come together. Yeah. How about that? Hmm. So, yeah, I, I just, I think one of the biggest bugaboos in this game, I mean, we talk about things that are to blame for losing this game, was missed tackles in the open field. And T2 had a few of them. Uh I'm trying to think of everybody who had some missed tackles, but there there were quite a few. And that's something that is a fixable B will be fixed as these players get out and actually tackle more throughout the season with the way the off seasons are uh, structured. You're not allowed to hit. You're not allowed to practice real live tackling. And with all the new rule changes and all that, it's difficult for guys to get in the work to be good at tackling early in the season. We've talked about this over and over again over the last five, six years. We're at the first four or five games of the year. The tackling's kind of poor. And then by the end of the year, they don't miss a thing. And so it's coming. Jonathan Stein hit on, hit on it as well. He said the timeout at the end of the game didn't lose it for us. Contributed, sure. But it was missed tackles, open receivers. Did I mention missed tackles? The, the tackling was catfish pathetic and they had 10 missed tackles on the day. Three of them from Justin Coleman. And that was because Robert Woods was holy smokes. He, that guy was the player of the game for the Rams, I think. And Tedrick Thompson, he did have two missed tackles in the game. Trey flowers had one. Shaquille Griffin had one. Frank Clark, Shamar Stefan, Barkevius Mingo. So that that's your rundown on missed tackles there. Right. I do believe that will get better. There were a lot of positives on yeah, defense as well. Frank Clark, you mentioned the forced fumble earlier, but then he comes up with the interception on the Rams' next drive. Second and goal from the two. Quick snap. Goff has time. Looks to the end zone. Throws. Ball's tipped in the air. Ball is picked off in the end zone. Coming near sideline is Clark. He's out across the 15. Breaks the tackle. Across the 20 to 25. Ball is tipped up in the end zone, and Frank Clark comes away with it. 
and he looks like the second coming of Jim Brown running the football all the way out to the 25 yard line. Hey, the, the, the Wyman chuckles are back. <laughs> yes. Those are great. Look, I, it's a real shame that the NFL won't allow Frank Clark to wear his cape out on the field because he is a superhero. <laughs> he deserves to wear a cape when he's out there on the field. Being hospitalized twice throughout the week, losing 12 pounds, and then on his, uh, I think it was his Instagram was like, oh no, I'm playing. Yeah. And then he comes out there and has a dominant performance. Ultimately only finishes with, with two pressures, but uh, the way he was playing early on in that game, especially, uh, he was the guy that you had to watch for. The fact that he caused the fumble that mm-hmm. led to the only punt in the game for the Rams on the very first drive for them. You said you said this was going to be a punting battle. Uh, we only saw the Rams punter on the field once. And then we saw that turnover that brought a score off the board for the Rams because they were right down there at the goal line. And, you know, the other person we should mention as part of that pick, Trey Flowers, getting his hand in there in front of Todd Gurley and tipping the ball up in the air. Bobby Wagner gets a hand on it, and it ultimately ends up in the hands of Frank Clark. Yeah, it, just a, a tremendous effort by Frank Clark. And I really hope I hear about a Frank Clark extension in the next couple of weeks before he hits uh, the open You don't market. want him to hit free agency. I don't even want to come close to there. <laughs> like, I've seen enough. Sign the man. He's young. He's dynamic. He's our best pass rusher by far. Doing it without Michael Bennett and Cliff Averill, which there was that question, right? Could Cliff Averill mm-hmm. still be the dominant pass rusher on a team without those players on the defensive Could line? Frank Clark be a dominant uh, right, right. pass Could rusher? Fra- yeah. yeah, without Cliff Averill or, or Bennett. And I think it, this defense and this pass rush will be benefited when Rasheem Green comes back. I, I, what exactly is wrong with him? That it's, ankle. It's an ankle. Okay. Well, we need him back. I, did Deion Jordan even play in this game? He did. He played, I think he played about half the snaps in this game. So it was a little bit surprising that that's he didn't show up more. That's yeah, a disappointing 20, performance. He had 22 snaps in this game and one pressure. It also sounds like Ken Norton and Pete Carroll are looking at ways to scheme up more pass rush. So we'll see that against the Raiders here and see if they can get after the quarterback a little bit more. But one of the things about the defensive line that we should talk about, or just the defense as a whole, is the way they're holding running backs in check. Todd Gurley, three point, what, four yards a carry throughout the game? The great second coming of Walter Payton, Todd Gurley? Yeah. And they they pretty much bottled him up. They bottled up David Johnson. They bottled up uh, Cohen against the Bears. The only guy that's really gashed him was Lindsey. That was week one. This defense can stop the run. And when you can stop the run and you can run the football, you're going to win a lot of football games, even in this pass happy era of football. I mean, the place that they didn't stop Gurley was inside the red zone with three touchdowns. But yeah, three and a half yards per carry, 22 carries, 77 yards. And he did have uh, some pretty good receiving numbers. His receiving numbers took him over 100 yards. He had uh, five targets, four receptions, 36 yards. Uh, they they bought him up about as well as I I think you you'd say that if he finished that that's okay, except for the touchdown numbers, I suppose. So I I really enjoy the idea of where this defense can go, where they are right now, and just knowing that that young secondary is going to do nothing but improve. The fact that Trey Flowers, I mean, he, looking at the the stats for this game, they didn't credit him with, with any catches. Interesting. I didn't know that. Two targets, no receptions, is what he was credited with. Bobby Wagner, though, five targets, five receptions. And a lot of those, I think, were just because it was the middle of the field was so wide open. So I think that's why Bobby Wagner takes uh, a lot of the blame for those open wide receivers over the middle. I don't think he was there necessarily to defend them because that was just it's, it seemed like that was their plan was the Seahawks to to funnel everything to the middle. Uh, Shaquille Griffin, seven targets, six receptions, 107 yards. Uh, he, he you know clearly had the most balls coming his way in this game. But again, it, it seemed like they were. He was he was bringing guys more toward the middle of the field. There were just a couple uh, catches on the outside that you saw. And 
that's where, I mean, majority of it, Bradley McDougal, two targets, two receptions for 35 yards. That's not a ton either. So those were kind of your three biggest contributors where the, where the passes went. Look, the Rams are going to get receptions on people. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's what they do. Uh, in we'll go back to the scheme. For now, this scheme is befuddling defenses for a bit here. And there, there will be a time, because this is exactly how the Rams attacked uh, the Vikings as well. A lot of, lot of crossers in yeah, slants. They use, they use that bunch formation. Yep. And they, that they can run the ball out of. And they mm-hmm. do pretty well getting, you know, especially if they're running the jet sweep out of that formation because you have you have your corners that have to respect the ability of the of the receivers mm-hmm. to and that kind of takes away the edge of, of the cornerbacks you know right, being right, able to set the, corner, the edge the corner has to set the edge just like you're saying and now you've got them bunched in towards the line of scrimmage it's much harder to set the edge at that point yeah and that, and yeah. they could fake it they they don't have to hand it off to the receiver and so that's why the corner there they have to go with the receiver rather than trying to set the edge in the run. It's going to be, I'm curious to see ultimately how that formation gets figured out, how defenses, it's what, gonna what defenses do to respond to that. It's going to happen. I promise you it's going to happen. <laughs> It'll happen. It's just, we were, we were beat by it several times in this game. It's like sure. in so Madden, was- in, in Madden, you find the one play where yeah. it, uh, you, you, it's, it seems unstoppable and they, and Sean McVay has that play right now. He has that formation. Mm -hmm. And they do dress it up in different ways, right? With slightly different personnel and the formation looks slightly different here and there, but it's more or less the same concept, what they're trying to, to get after. And it's interesting because over the years, you know, as the NFL has evolved into more of a passing game and kind of taken on the college style offense, it's been spread them out, get people in space. So here's the thing that Sean McVay has done that is different than the trend that everybody else has been doing. Like that Patriots spread them out, quick twitch little slot receivers and just get them in space. He's bringing everybody in Mm -hmm. and then using the natural picks and everything then to create space outside the numbers. Right. So it's interesting. It is. We'll see what the I'm not. Again, I'm not a coach in the NFL. I'm not a I'm not a genius. I'm just a dude who watches football. So do I have the answer for this? No, I haven't given it enough thought and really looked at it. But there's a lot lot of people out there that are much brighter than me that will figure this out. Like Ken Norton Jr. And I cannot wait. I cannot <laughs> wait to see these guys again. Yeah. We're beating and- them the second time. I I'll make it's a guarantee. I'm Joe Namath right now. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to beat the Rams the second time we play them, as long as Russell Wilson's on the field and Chris Carson's on the field. Well, I am a little bit curious to see who the Rams face defensively in the coming weeks, you know, between between now and the, and the next time that we see them, because, you know, they do have Denver this coming week. Uh, I wouldn't expect the San Francisco defense to come up with anything to stop them. The Green Bay defense isn't going to come up with anything to stop them. And New Orleans isn't. So you, you're really counting on Denver to show, show you a little something uh, before Ken Norton gets his second crack at him. And then, you know, other defensive coordinators down the road, they play Chicago, they play Philly. I mean, just remember to the Philly last year, right? And everybody, oh, this offense is unstoppable. Like you can't can't do anything against it. You know, the right. RPOs and the whole thing. And how's that offense look this year? They're not unstoppable. This all has a shelf life, man. This gimmicky crap. So that's one of the things like I've been hearing a lot. I mean, everybody praising Andy Reid, praising Sean McVay, praising Nagy. Oh, this well, type, Pete Carroll this and type of Daryl Bevel had their turn at getting the praise too when they were running the read option so effectively. Correct. This gimmicky football crap, it always gets figured out. It always gets figured out by the defense. You know what stands the test of time? And everybody's saying, oh, this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do to be successful. Well, you know what stands the test of time? Running the football. That is constant. That has never changed in this league, and it never will. And let's talk about that, because that was the success of the Seahawks in this game. And it, it allowed Russell Wilson to have success in this game too, uh, up until the fourth quarter, really. Um, Chris Carson, 19 carries, 116 yards, average of 6.1 per carry. Mike Davis, 12 carries, 68 yards. 
uh, 5.7 average per carry. And to do it against this Rams defensive line and to see DJ Fluker, you know, especially as the Ram, especially as the Seahawks got toward the goal line and seeing DJ Fluker just absolutely pancake and Dominican Sue on this touchdown run by Davis. First and goal from the six, a hand to Davis again. He scored through. He is in. Touchdown, Seahawks. Dave, you are right. This Rams defense hasn't been punched in the mouth like this this season. And on this drive, the Seahawks, after the interception by Frank Clark, take advantage from six yards out and take the early lead, 6 nothing. Look, that's an amazing one-two punch between Carson and Mike Davis. And I really like the idea that they're running those two guys instead of scat back Rashad Penny. And that's, it's making a difference, and you've seen it. Are you of the mindset, like all these other articles that have come out, that the Seahawks have wasted a first-round pick on Penny, and this is a disaster, and blah 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 I don't know why you would make a decision uh, about Penny so soon. Like, why? Why? You have Chris Carson. You have Mike Davis. Like, yeah. okay, sure, five weeks into it, it looks as though there would have been other better options to, to take at that point. But what for do we an say immediate about the return draft? for an immediate return, for right? an immediate return. Yeah. So everybody's got to look at this through a different lens. I've been saying it since they drafted the guy. He's not ready. He needs a year. <laughs> like, I, let's see what this looks like. Year two, year three. That's what I that's what I'm curious to see. That's what I'll tell you. I was either wrong or right regarding this draft pick. Like, I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and crow about it. Saying, "Oh, I was right. They shouldn't have picked the picked this guy in the first round." Right now, that's right ridiculous. Now, right now, you're looking at the best case scenario. You have all your running backs healthy, except for CJ Procise, who can't make it on the field. Who? But you, have, yeah, right. Um, yeah. yeah. What was that no, movie? They, what was that movie with Samuel L. Jackson and uh, like Bruce? Was it Bruce Willis? Where he's just like Samuel L. Just is a like a uh, a super villain who's just always hurt. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Unbreakable. Yeah, there. That's a Mr. that's Glass. CJ Procise right yeah. there. Yeah, JD McKissick is going to come back and take his job in in a week or two. Yes, I mean, I like Procise, but as a dude, oh, absolutely, as a human being. But health is a part of talent, and he doesn't have it. It's unfortunate, and I don't think he has a Pete. I think it was two weeks ago when Procise came out uh, pregame and was trying to get going, and. Felt something, what was it, in his core, I think, yeah. or groin? <laughs> you, you've explained tweak. almost every time the, the process has been out. He's, he's come out before the game and then felt something. Right. And, and then can't go. I could hear it in Pete's voice, just how exasperated he was. I can never say that word. Is that right? Exasperated. That right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was with Penny, and you get the sense that he feels like, Pe- or not Penny, but uh, Procise. I get the sense from Pete that he doesn't believe in Procise's ability to tough out anything. He has no toughness to him, no grit. Well, it's been three years. I mean, yeah. you can understand. Yeah. But let's talk about a player who does have grit and is completely living up to that contract that he signed early on the season. Receiver Tyler Lockett. Big game for him. And as he catches just three passes, but for 98 yards, including this touchdown from Russell Wilson. Bennett now sets in motion on the left side. Here comes the rush. Russell looks. He's going to throw deep. Hey, I'm Russell Wilson, and I throw a sexy deep ball. He's got a man. Tyler Rocket is out there. He's got it. Touchdown, Seahawks. A great fake all by Russell Wilson and a 39-yard rainbow to Tyler Lockett, who had beaten his man to the end zone, and the Seahawks retake the lead. Wyman just needs to realize, like, he has to just, if you're going to be excited, just go for it. It almost seems like he's trying to hold back on his excitement, and that's why it comes out the way it does. Yeah, it feels like somebody in a production meeting somewhere when he was doing practice calls going into the season <laughs> told him to like take it down a few notches or something. Yeah. Uncork it. I want to see why I'm just uncork it. But look, Russ Wilson uncorked a sexy deep ball to Tyler Lockett there. And it's been written about. And so I, I'm not going to get into it a ton. 
But because we're not the geniuses that are bringing this up or, or like bringing this to light, but play action has been the Seattle Seahawks friend, Russell Wilson's friend, and they had a gaudy over 12 yards per pass attempt uh, stat when it came to throwing off of play action. It is very effective. It plays right into Russell Wilson's hands, and you saw it there on a beautiful deep pass to Tyler. I kind of agree with the the people in the stats community that, that say you don't necessarily need to be that successful with the run to have the play action be that effective. But yeah, Tyler Lockett absolutely torched Marcus Peters uh, on that touchdown. And I want to go back to something you said earlier about, and also in the email, about Russell Wilson keeping the ball a little bit more. We're, yeah. we're not seeing that. And when I see plays like this, where Russell Wilson is down the field blocking. I don't, I'm not buying the idea that his hamstring has any kind of issue with him running. Russell from the shotgun. Hands it off to Davis straight ahead inside. He's got a first down and more. He's out of court to 40. He's on the run midfield. He's got blockers. 40, 30, knocked out of bounds. Just shy of the 30-yard line. Mike Davis starts up inside, bounces it outside. John Johnson finally ran him out. DJ Fluker was 20 yards downfield blocking, as were two wide receivers. So was Russell. A big 37-yard game. Yeah, I'm with you on this one, I think. I mean, maybe his hamstring is bothering him, but it's not severe by any stretch of the imagination. Like, he could still keep the ball on a read option and run around the corner, I think, and pick up six, seven yards. We, we haven't given David Moore his love in this game. Uh, you, you called out Mike Davis for having a generic name. You also have Der- David Moore. He was That's on not the, he that was, generic. It's, it's a little bit generic. You don't know a lot of Moores. Do you know one person with the last name Moore? There's all kinds of dudes in the NFL with the last name Moore. Uh, it's not it's not Davis Common or Anderson. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you do have you, you you talk about Russell Wilson's ability to keep the play alive, and he finds David Moore in the back of the end zone for his first career NFL touchdown. Ninth play of the drive on second down and goal. Russell play fake looks. Stops, looks again, now he starts again, now he rolls right, still looking to the end zone, now he goes, touchdown, Seahawks, David Moore, but did he get knocked out of the back of the end zone, the Rams say he stepped out, one official has his hat off, touchdown, officials say touchdown, David Moore kept himself alive and from three yards out, he scores his first NFL touchdown and Russell Wilson kept that play alive. Well, he reestablished himself in bounds. I don't, I don't think he went out. I think it was uh, the other guy who, uh, yeah, I think it was Vanette who went out. I thought they both went out. Oh, well, maybe he did. But if, if, they, if he did go out, he did reestablish himself because that's what the officials called. Correct. But I don't know Moore's what it been... means to reestablish yourself. Like, I don't know what to look for. If you just have to get a couple more feet back in bounds to yeah, I think it's uh, both you feet. Go out. You kind of have to be in bounds for a beat or two. It, it's definitely a judgment call. Yeah, I mean maybe there maybe there's a actual rule to this, but I'm not familiar with it. I mean there there is a rule. It just says you have to reestablish yourself. Right. I just don't know what that looks like. I don't know. I don't know. Hard to say. But David Moore has been a bit of a revelation. He's starting to live up to that preseason hype that we had heard. And I think we found our top three receivers at this point, right? Doug Baldwin, Tyler Lockett, David Moore. And then you sprinkle in a little Brandon Marshall and, and Brown. And that's your, that's your receiving core. Yeah, I'm a little bit surprised we haven't seen more of John Brown out there. But it does feel like it, yeah. it's coming together with those three guys. Doug Baldwin, you know, despite having more snaps than any other receiver, he had 53 snaps. Just one catch for one yard early on in the first quarter where Russell Wilson just flips it to him a little bit and he steps out of bounds. Uh, you have David Moore, and like I said, the number three guy, 31 snaps about 50% of the time. And then Brandon Marshall just had seven snaps. And if you're just mixing him inside the red zone, I, I think that's fine. That's totally fine, especially for a veteran receiver, because I'd rather keep him fresh throughout the season. Yeah. So that, that really works well. And uh, one of the emailers that asked earlier, one of the little flockers about the idea of Doug Baldwin only having one reception and if that should be a cause for concern. And I'd say no. Look, I think a lot of it revolves around the fact the way the Rams were playing, they were trying to take away Doug Baldwin. They know he's the number one option. And I don't see the knee injuries as being completely 
a problem in far as far as it taking away his production on the field. I think it was a focus on what the Rams were trying to take away. And so then Russell went to other places. That's how offense works. Yeah. And I think Sam Shields, uh, he, he may even be now that uh, Aqib Talib went down to injury. He's their number one corner, in my opinion. He, I think he's back into that form that we saw him with in the Packers. Now, hopefully he can stay healthy because that's always kind of been his issue throughout his career. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think he is the, the best corner on that team right now. Yeah, I, I believe he is. And, and that was the guy on Baldwin this game. Yeah, I mean, people blaming Peter's injury as the reason for his struggles, they don't understand Marcus Peter's game. He is a total gambler, and you saw him get beat. I believe it was on that David Moore touchdown by looking into the backfield. And if your front front four aren't getting home and getting immediate pressure, Marcus Peters is a problem and a liability. That's why the Chiefs were willing to get rid of him. And, and you're absolutely right. He he got beat the second time on the second David Moore touchdown. Play fake to him. Russell looks left. Now comes back. He's going to throw deep David Moore. He's there. Touchdown, Seahawks. Are you kidding me? David Moore, the second coming of Raymond Berry. Two touchdowns <laughs> in this game for the youngster from 30 yards out. Beat, beat, back the truck up. Like, let's let's hold off the Raymond Barry comparisons here already. All right. Now, maybe you need to explain who Raymond Barry is, because is this another one of Rabel's 80s references? Oh, this is a Raymond Barry was a player for the Colts back with Johnny Unitas. He was <laughs> he was the all time leader in everything receiving at, at one point. So this isn't even an 80s reference. This is like a 60s reference. Oh, this is the Wayback Machine. How <laughs> dare you not know who Raymond Barry is? He was a game changer. He was the Randy Moss of his era. He was Jerry Rice of his era. From 1955 to 1967. But now we all know. So you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Rabel. But uh, David Moore's playing great. This team put together a performance, even in a loss, that has me looking towards the second half of this schedule where we play almost exclusively at home. And I'm licking my chops for it, man. We will get at least a wild card spot. Because tell me the team in the NFC other than the Saints, than the Saints that (laughs) scare you. Who else scares you that you think is legitimately better than the Seahawks? Okay, legitimately better is one thing, but one of the things that I am concerned about is how the tiebreakers will play out with the NFC North team. Because I'm assuming at this point the Rams are going to take the division, and you know there's going to be two other division winners. I think the other wild card team comes out of the the North. I think the I think the other wild card comes out of the South. That's a good point. So you have maybe one wild card team out of the South, one out of the North that's competing for it. And we've already lost one game to the Bears. And I know they're looking good right now. They're kind of up there. The the media loves the Bears along with the Chiefs and the Rams, apparently now. Mm-hmm. So with their easy schedule, they'll win that division. You think the Bears are winning the division? I do. The Packers are a mess. Interesting. The they Packers are a, are a hot mess. So the Vikings would be the one competing for the wild card. So you just have to... You have to win that game at home against the Vikings. That would be critical. That tie really hurts the Vikings. Well, we'll see. Ties can either help or hurt. It's going to hurt them. Okay. We're making the playoffs, man. I I hope so. Because out of the South, you look at New Orleans is probably winning that division, right? Yeah. And then I think the Panthers are probably one of your wild card teams. Because again, uh, a pretty cupcakey schedule. I mean, this this is what they do. They rattle off regular season wins as a mediocre team. And we play the Panthers, so you have to win that road game. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so you're counting on that. Yeah, So those are, sure. those are two Newton of the critical games down the, the stretch yeah. would be the Panthers and Vikings. Yes. And winning the games that you're supposed to win. Correct. Like this home. game against the Raiders. We've spent an hour already, Brandon, <laughs> uh, talking about this Rams game because it was fascinating in a million different ways. How does this translate as they go across the pond, go to Wembley, and take on Chucky and the Oakland Raiders in beast mode? The Raiders game is coming up. I'm I'm sure many of us are going into debt 
to travel to London to watch our Seahawks. And if you're if you're looking at your credit card statement, either now before or after after the game, and you're saying uh, 18% interest, or maybe even more than that, holy smokes. Well, Lightstream offers credit card consolidation loans from 5.89 APR with auto pay way lower than the average credit card interest rate, over 18%. Uh, a fun fact, Adam. Yeah. Uh, Lightstream plants a tree with every loan that they fund. So... Lightstream actually helping keeping uh, you and me employed. Absolutely. And it's help. it could help a lot of 12s get to London because, yeah, max out those credit cards with all that, that crazy high interest you know, loans or basically on your credit card, right? Yeah. You go to Lightstream and like make the smarter choice. Take all that debt, put it there, only pay pennies on the dollar in interest compared to your credit card. Go to the game and have a good time. Lightstream does that for you. Oh, and uh, there's a shiny new tree somewhere. I think that's a good deal. You know, for me, I, I go to lightstream.com slash hawkers and I'm looking for at a lease buyout for my truck. You know, I, we've talked about this with me being a truck guy now, but I, I just went with the <laughs> lease. But now I, I, I didn't think know I'm, you leased that. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go all in. That's a it's a good way to, to, to decide, you know, to 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 ease your way into truck ownership. Uh, there, you don't own anything when you lease it. It's a way to, you know me, I like to sit on the fence and be indecisive. This is a way for me to do that. And now, oh, gross. now that I've decided, I can go to lightstream.com slash hawkers and I can get the, the lease buyout. Heck, well, do that. Like, hopefully Lightstream can help you out with that because that, that's, wow. They can. And our listeners will get a special discount on top of Lightstream's already low rates. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash hawkers L I G H T S T R E A M dot com slash hawkers H A W K E R S. This is subject to credit approval. Rate includes a 0.50% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply, and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash hawkers for more information. All right, Adam. Well, going into this game against the Raiders, let's let's give a little bit more love to our offensive line. And yeah, that does kind of tie back to this game against the Rams, but Hawk blogger points out the Seahawks offensive line now ranks seventh in the NFL in pass blocking efficiency per pro football focus over the last three weeks with DJ Fluker in, they rank number two. And that's considering that they faced Von Miller, Khalil Mack in those first couple weeks. And now is since Fluker came in, Demarcus Lawrence, Aaron Donald. They only gave up eight pressures against the Rams this past week. Not eight sacks, but eight pressures. As he points out, this is not Tom Cable's offensive line. Instead, Tom Cable's offensive line on the other side of the football. Very true. The offensive line is playing lights out. So you mentioned the addition of DJ Fluker into the lineup, but let us not forget the addition of J.R. Sweezy into the lineup. We just need to find a couple more guys that use uh, an abbreviation for their first name, like a two yeah. letter. Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe if Jermaine Effetti changed it to like, you know, GI Effetti, <laughs> like he'd be better. It's kind of like GI Joe. Yeah, he'd be an American hero, but <laughs> the offensive line going up against this Raiders defense, this is where I'm licking my chops, looking at this matchup, especially with John Gruden inexplicably trading away Khalil Mack. They're not super strong up front. And basically, the guy that you're most concerned about is Bruce Irvin. And we know all about Bruce. Yeah, so, it was weird looking down the list uh, or looking at the last matchup where the Seahawks faced the Raiders because it was back in 2014, the last time that they played in the regular season. Yeah. And of course, that was in the run to the second Super Bowl appearance. Bruce Irvin, Marshawn Lynch, both playing for Seattle. Sebastian Janikowski kicking for the Raiders. And the Seahawks won that game 30 to 24 in Seattle. Pretty interesting there. I think the idea of running the football again is very important in this game just to keep the Raiders offense off the field because if they do have one unit that is their strength, that it's definitely their offense. And with Marshawn running the ball the way he is, I mean, he's turned back the clock. He looks like old Marshawn. You need to match that physicality. So it's going to be paramount for the Seahawks and Chris Carson and a little Mike Davis sprinkled in too to impose their will on this game early and often. And I believe they will. And Russell Wilson will have his chances then to pick apart this kind of poor secondary. 
I feel like this is going to be a game that's like 31-17 Seahawks. I think it I, I think the travel it it brings up some questions for me just not knowing how teams are going to respond but looking at how the teams are responding even even the week leading up to it I saw John Gruden with I mean he's it's already in his head leading up to this game he said I'm not a great traveler I'll be honest with you I hate it I'm not good I'm concerned I'm more worried about that than our goal line offense right now Wow. So you have you have the Raiders coach before they're even traveling, talking about how worried he is and how uh, how terrible of a traveler he was. This is this is already in the opposing coach's head where you see Pete Carroll just, you know, saying that this is just something you have to deal with and it'll be fine. And we've already figured it out. We've done test trips. We've got like the whole thing. Completely opposite reactions from the two coaches. I like where Pete's head's at. That's for sure. But this is going to be the first regular season international series game in franchise history. They did have a couple preseason games uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. An interesting thing is this is a 10 a.m. Pacific start time. But the other international series games are the the 6.30 a.m. Pacific start times. I, I just thought that was curious that we get the later one. Maybe it has to do with both teams being West Coast teams uh, that they gave a later start. But we won't be the only game on TV to start the day. A lot of hand-wringing about the travel and the time zone changes and all that nonsense. Again, just sit on your flying recliner in the sky for a couple hours. Go somewhere else. Don't fall asleep when you first get there. Go to bed that night and then wake up and play football. Like, this isn't rocket science. I think like, the big question is, is how, how do the Raiders respond to the idea of throwing an interception when they were first in goal at the one-yard line? <laughs> and deciding to throw the ball rather yeah. than run it with Marshawn Lynch and Mel- Melvin Ingram picks it off in the end zone. You know, how how do the Raiders respond to that adversity moving forward? <laughs> uh, they'll be fine. <laughs> the The thing that you need to be concerned about if you're a Seahawks fan coming into this game is Derek Carr throwing the ball with good efficiency. He's completing over 70% of his passes. He's playing the system very well. They do have weapons all over the place. Jordy Nelson has started to break out a little bit. Amari Cooper is a, a great weapon. And the guy, honestly, that I look at that to me will be the key to this game is Jared Cook, believe it or not. I mean, mm-hmm. this is a guy that we've seen uh, in different uh, uniforms over the years, whether that's the Rams or the Packers. But he's playing out of his mind. And yeah. we all know that that seamer out with the tight end is a bit of a bugaboo. And I feel like their ability to cover that is going to be the biggest difference in this game in stopping the Raiders offense. Yeah, I could absolutely see that. Jared Cook's been I mean, tearing up the league so far, uh, despite the fact that they only have one win on the season. Derek Carr, I guess he's playing average. I wouldn't say he's playing bad, I think. And I guess if it comes down to it, though, I look at the way, at just how physical the Seahawks are playing over the last few weeks. I mean, we have... We're starting to see an identity come together, and mm-hmm. and they do look like the more physical football team, especially on the offensive line. And I think that's why you're seeing J.R. Sweezy keeping his job at left guard still. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's okay with me because it's okay to have depth on the offensive line. I know we're not used to it. Right. But there's it's cool that if a guy goes down, you have guys that you can count on, like Joey Hunt backing up Justin Britt. You have Ethan Posick at pick a position. Right. I mean, these guys can legitimately play. Yeah, the physicality is different. And people you even la- see George Fant out there. People me when I said, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, bringing in Fant as an extra blocker has been effective and creative, and I uh, give him credit for, for doing it. People made fun of me for being excited about the Sweezy pickup. I didn't agree with the Sweezy pickup, but I was wrong about that. And people made fun of me about the DJ Fluker pickup. Yeah. People made fun of me too. about my, my Rashad Penny take. Look, maybe maybe listen to me more is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. I may know things. Y- you might. Or you're really good at guessing. One of the right. two. Yeah, I'd rather be lucky than good, dude. Well, it will be the Seahawks' ability to get pressure uh, with just the front four, and that's that's really been a struggle for them to this point of the season. You know, Deion Jordan, Rasheem Green being out, Frank Clark can't do it all by himself. Uh, he he will get his couple plays here and there for sure, but 
this is a, a pretty talented offensive line for the Raiders too. And you do have Marshawn Lynch. It's just that the Seahawks have been able to, to stop those top backs. And now we've seen it with David Johnson. Now that we're seeing it with Todd Gurley, I think we can expect to see it with Marshawn Lynch too. Yeah. Bottle up Marshawn the, to the best of your ability. Uh, keep them off the field, number one, by just holding the ball and winning time of possession. I think that's going to be a big part of it. Be super cognizant, uh, be super aware of Jared Cook over the middle. Take that option away and then try to make him beat you outside the numbers and with pushing the ball down the field a little bit. Derek Carr will make mistakes. It's, it's been in his DNA since he's gotten to the league. I like the idea of, I think Trey Flowers gets his first pick in this game. I like that. Maybe going up against uh, their their top receiver, too. Whether that's Cooper or, or Nelson, take your pick. I mean, their top receiver has been Jared Cook. Well, I guess maybe that's why I'm like, say, focus on Jared Cook. Like, let's make yeah. sure, yeah, that we have an answer for him. And Yeah, you got veteran Jordy Nelson, too. That's what I keep saying. Nelson or, or Cooper. Okay. I thought you said somebody other than Nelson. No, I thought that's what I said. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know. I wasn't listening. Well, that makes sense. I don't know why anybody would be. This is a marathon. You know, I was curious about one thing going to this game because in the past, the Seahawks record on grass hasn't been very great. So I was curious about the the surface that they're playing on this weekend. And uh, I found at uh, the Atco website, it says the Wembley pitch has a Deso Grassmaster system, which was introduced to overcome early problems with the pitch after the new stadium was opened in 2007. The technology combines synthetic grass with the real Wembley grass and uses a sub air system integrated under soil heating and artificial lighting. So this is it's not a, a grass field. It's actually a mix. This sounds like some <laughs> unholy mutant hybrid of a field. It like is some cyborg like field to play on. I don't, I don't know about this pseudo real fake grass. Yeah, I, uh, now you're worried. See, there's no. There, there's no real uh, test it just case seems for this. Like, it just seems like an abomination to the to the world. Like yeah. you know, you what like I mean? make a decision, like pick grass or pick I turf. Know. I don't know. Like I just picture like some of those weird science experiments where they like you know graft like a an ear onto the back of a rat or something. You know, like it's just a bad. It just doesn't seem right. You see, I think I think this is this is a wild card in this game that we 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 need to concern ourselves with. All I know is I'll be there and I'll I won't be worried about it then. We are going to be there. And is there anything else that you want to say going into this matchup with the Raiders? You know, this this team looking at football outsiders in terms of DVOA, the, the Raiders are at uh, number 27 in the league right now, just ahead of Tampa Bay, Detroit, Arizona, San Fran, Buffalo. I mean, there's there's a lot of questionable teams there. I think DVOA is a, a good stat to look at. And, and I don't like DVOA at all. You don't like DVOA? It's just it's it's just compares look, the Raiders have, their the Raiders performance have over played, the average. I don't care. The, the, the Raiders have played some decent teams over the course of their beginning part of their schedule and have been in every game. Just haven't had the ability to close yet. So that's that'll be the number one thing that I'm looking at is fourth quarter performances from two teams who are still trying to learn how to close. Their DVOA stat is far too low for as competitive as they've been. Yeah, they they did. They lo- only lost to the Broncos by a point in Denver in week two. They did get blown out by the Rams in week one. But let us not forget, through three quarters, they were either up or right in that game. Oh, for the for the first half, yeah. All right, that's fine. true. First they went two and in a half they, quarters in. Like, yeah. fine. They're coming off a game two, a 26 to 10 loss to the Chargers. The Chargers just haven't seemed all that impressive to me. Then you're not watching the right football. Their two losses have been against the Chiefs and the Rams. Okay. The Chargers are good. Well, I'm, I'm going to reserve judgment on the Chargers. Get off the box, Brandon. Have an opinion already. Jeez hey, Louise. We're five weeks in. Are you going to lease the Chargers so you don't have to make a decision about them? I will. I will until I decide that I'm buying them. All right, throw away, throw away your football, uh, your football money that way. Then, okay. Maybe I will. The Raiders have been competitive. I don't think DVOA. I some of these advanced metrics just are like like QBR it, again is another one I don't like. I'm I'm less on that one. The 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 DVOA is one that I I actually like, and I think it puts the Seahawks more of where my expectations are. 
as a two and three football team. They have them as number 12 overall right now, kind of in the same neighborhood as uh, Jacksonville, Green Bay, Carolina. And I'm a little surprised to see Houston here, but they've kind of come on these last couple of weeks uh, because they're a decent team. As I've been trying to tell you on the pick show and you keep pooing me. I know Houston's making me look dumb because I, yeah, I fell off the, yeah, it just, it's just not good. They're, they'll be okay. <laughs> but I, look, those are all teams that I would say that we should absolutely be on par with. It's just, I, know, the the Oakland, I, I can't get over fire. the Oakland defense. I guess that's where I look and I see where one unit of ours is completely more dominant than that Oakland unit that gave up 42 points to the Cleveland and special Browns. teams. Special teams were great against the Rams. Michael Dixon is still a revelation. We d- we didn't talk about the drop kicks. Yeah, we don't need to talk about it too much. <laughs> but I mean, basically, I like the decision in the sense that Janikowski somehow wasn't getting out of the back of the end zone. I don't know if that was by design or whatever, but they were gashing us on returns early. Yeah, and the so first they, two returns. Yeah, and the first drop kick wasn't specifically effective. I mean, I think they ended up around the 35 or something like that. So it wasn't a huge change, but it got better as the game went on. And uh, yeah, I I mean, I liked it. Curious to see how, how that uh, plays out moving forward. We do have an email from Jerry in Warwick, England says hi to Adam and Brandon to all the other Hawks, Hawks fans from the U S and from Europe. The game is a sellout with all tickets going within five minutes. For me, like many other, it is a chance to see the Hawks for the first time, having supported them since the 80s. I have listened to you guys for the last two years for free, being a cheapskate, but carrying on the good work. I listen to the podcast to cheer me up on the dreary drives and endless queues on British roads, with your cheery banter making the miles soon disappear. I would like to apologize to the rest of the fans in Section 526 for my foghorn of a mouth while cheering on Pete and the boys on Sunday. I believe there will be far more Hawks fans and Raiders there, all having their Field of Dreams moment. If you build it, they will come. All the best. Jerry Palmer. Go Hawks. See you there, Jerry. And do never apologize for being a loud and proud 12. Uh, And I agree with him. I think that the stadium will feel much more like a home game for the Hawks. Just looking at the amount of uh, little flockers that are going to be in the stadium. Like, I mean, just us, just us from this show. We might be the difference in that game. <laughs> like, there's Maybe. a lot of there's a lot of folks going that listen to the pod. It's pretty crazy it, it, in, in all areas of the stadium. It is. Yeah, it was cool that uh, Hong Kong Hawk Dave Bloomquist put together a little uh, diagram on our, our our London Facebook page for the podcast. And you know what, Jerry, uh, he he pointed out that uh, he's been listening for free. That's fine. Uh, but you know what else? Uh, no new members of the flock this week, Adam. Uh, what? Yeah, uh, we're, we are sitting at a pretty good number, 312. I, I think it's a good number to be at uh, at gettingtheflock.com. But uh, yeah, we got we got skunked this week, dude. That's unacceptable. <laughs> we're in the middle of the season, working our butts off, putting out three shows a week. Not one. Not one. Man. So I, I was I was going to give out the link to the London Facebook page just on the show. Uh, but instead, I think I'm I'm going to have to post it at, at gettingtheflock.com dot com mm-hmm. and and a post there just so people have to go to that site to to find out where the link is. There you go. I like it. Just so well, just so to make sure that you're aware that 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 site still exists. Yeah, absolutely. Because somehow it it's been forgotten. Yeah. But uh, and and if you're a cheapskate like Jerry, you know you don't have to sign up, but. You know the, that link will be there to the Facebook page, and and we'll get you added to the group. I like how I like how you've uh, added a a new moniker to throw at people that don't donate to the show. I I went with freeloader. Oh well, and now you're no, going Jerry, with cheapskate. Jerry said cheapskate right in his email. I'm oh, just okay. So that just was using his words. All right. Well, it's funny <laughs> that he called our banter cheery. Uh, I would imagine that anything in that comes from outside of the UK feels cheery compared to what's going on there, right? Like isn't that isn't that the, the 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 stereotype of England is that it's just kind of a dreary, sad place? Oh yeah, like Seattle. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Maybe that's why there are so many uh, UK fans of the Seahawks. I don't know. So with the game in London coming up, uh, we we got an email here from from Dave Bloomquist. I think we should listen into this little bit of audio that he sent along to us. Hello, hello, British Brandon and Orgy Borgy Adam. 
unpacking me rucksack and polishing up me accent, getting ready for me trip to the UK. We're gonna have a banging time, we are. All me twelve mates and me. It'll be a jolly holiday. Them bloody blankers from Oakland are a dog's dinner. I'd be gobsmacked what they even gave us a proper match. Well, tickety-boo, flockers, I'm off to Bedfordshire. I'll be looking forward to having a right chin-wagging with all me birds and geezers over a couple of King Lears. Jubbly wobbly Oh, and catfish and chips, them manky raiders. I, I'm going to go ahead and apologize uh, on behalf of the show uh, for Dave, because I, I, I have no idea if that's offensive. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all I know is that his uh, British accent is better than mine. <laughs> so I, I'm going to give him a, a major pat on the back, a major round of applause. All of the uh, slang terms seem to fit. Uh, and uh, whether or not it's it's stereotypical and offensive, I liked it. So I'm, I'm in. Well, Hats off. I am. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Dave coming up here as well. He's not. Is he going to be there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. One review here uh, says sleep can wait. Honestly, I don't know why other podcasts don't take notes from your show. Keep up the good work, guys. And to everyone who doesn't say go Hawks at the end of each podcast, do better. <laughs> well, thanks, man. That now, now I'm feeling a little bit of the love again. That feels nice. Yeah. And Scott A H nineteen eighty two on iTunes says, "Awesome podcast. I love tuning into the show. Great insight. I do have a question on the Arizona Cardinal game and Earl Thomas. Didn't see any good plays from him. Then he gets injured and gives the bird to the sideline. What's your insight on him? I'm from Spokane, Washington. Hey there, from Spokane. I, I'll be." Be spending a week uh, just north of there, uh, not long from now, doing a really big job. But uh, I, we've we've kind of covered the Earl stuff, yeah. But I appreciate the review, man. Yeah, that uh, that game against the Cardinals it was maybe one of his rougher days uh, to go out on. But uh, yeah, we got we got two two now, and and that's who we're rolling with. So uh, good to see a good game from Tedrick. Hopefully that continues against the Raiders. Randy from Fort Jones, California. Hey guys, just wanted to drop a quick note after listening to the last episode where you recap the Cardinal game. Uh, I too have been pleasantly surprised at the quality of our play from our young defensive backfield. We will never again have a quote Legion of Boom, but would you dare say we have baby boomers? I know it's corny, <laughs> but so is Little Flockers, and that's stuck. Go Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> fair. That's absolutely fair. Uh, with a, you know an argument like that, it's difficult for me to not be on board with baby boomer. <laughs> I hope that doesn't stick. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it will. <laughs> I, I kind of hope the little flockers yeah. wouldn't stick either, but... But it did. But it did. Yeah. One day you're going to like it, I promise. Okay. Well, now that we have patches with it on there, and I'm going to be bringing patches and stickers and stuff to the, the game this week, too. So if for those yeah. of you who, who did get in the flock or are planning to... Mm-hmm. I will. I will have envelopes for you, so just to just to save me uh, a few bucks on shipping. I'll bring them with me. Yeah. Hey, you bet. What's What's better than having uh, a little Seahawkers podcast swag mailed to you? Having it hand delivered. So that, exactly. uh, yeah, I, I think that's going to be great. It's going to be so much fun to hang out with all y'all over there. Uh, we're going to have a meetup, I'm sure, right, Brandon? We are, yeah, and uh, we will have that. We'll post the details on the Facebook page. We are, uh, we're going to be at the UK Seahawkers gathering on Saturday night. I know we're going to try and swing by that Seahawks uh, bar that's uh, on the Seahawks.com website that they're featuring. Our hotel is not too far from there, so I think we'll probably be there on Saturday at some point, and then we're planning a pregame meetup uh, location only disclosed on the Facebook page to. Uh, hit up before the game on Sunday. Yeah, the Ring of Honor Facebook page. No, our, which, our, uh, our Seahawkers London page. Oh, right. Which, uh, if you want that link, you have to go to getintheflock.com. There you go. Well, we haven't mentioned our Pick'em League leaderboard yet, Adam. Yeah, that's because I don't care about it anymore. You're done with that? I don't know. <laughs> I, no, I do care about it. I just... A little bummed out of my performance so far. Yeah. Well, D. Weezy has the lead. 53 correct guesses so far this year. And you got Jake Off and Jess Trev, who's leading it up. 
Jess is uh, she's also number two uh, behind D Weezy on the the VIP Flockers leaderboard. She was a, a correct score away from winning this past week. She loses the tiebreaker with voice in Jared Goff's head. Sam gets the win. <laughs> he he guessed a cumulative score on the Monday night game of sixty three points. So Sam gets the tiebreaker and the win. Well, that's a pretty solid team name. And I think just based on that, you got to get the win, right? Yeah. Even you know what? The- that that might be Jess's problem. She did not. She just is going with the the abbreviated. Uh, I'm just her, her just name saying. abbreviation rather than just saying rather than a team name. Yeah, rather than come up with uh, a creative team name. So think yeah, about that, I mean, Jess. It's, it's just how it goes. Although she's in third place overall, so she she's still doing better than most of us. Now, now you're just mocking me. <laughs> Or tied for second place overall, rather. So, right. Yes. And this week, we are going to. You know what? I, I don't think I'm going to announce the prize this week because because of the fact that you and I are going to London. I say mm-hmm. I say we pick up a souvenir in London to uh, for this week's Pick'em prize. Done and done. I totally concur with this. It's a great idea. So even if you're not going to the game, this is your chance to uh, to win the league and and get a cool prize. Absolutely. If you are a VIP flocker at $3 or above, get in the flock.com. We'll find out if our picks are any better this week. Uh, if you do get in the flock, you do get the bonus shows. And the bonus shows consist of all of our picks uh, from the uh, from the NFL uh, for the coming week. And uh, a little bit of our insight into each and every one of those games. It's entertaining. And uh, the trash talk is fun. So uh, just a dollar a month gets you those extra shows. And we're bringing some Seahawks content into it this week with with Tim Moon's uh, Pete Carroll essay. There you go. All right. On to do better and better at life, Adam. My do better is for everybody that's ripping Odell Beckham this last week. (laughs) That was really weird. Like, what did he do? Well, apparently he had some comments regarding Eli and some kind of veiled shots at Pat Shermer a little bit about offensive play calling and things like that. Now, apparently he he had some things that... uh, we're a little bit of a blow up back in the locker room as well. But again, he did that now inside and kept it within the confines of the team, right? Right. Didn't do it out in public. I watched him in the last game calming down Sterling Shepard, who was having a tissy fit, much like Odell used to have. And for people to be mad at Odell for calling out Eli a little bit, watching this uh, Giants Panthers game, watching this whole season. How in the world are you mad at Odell for calling out Eli a little bit? He's been terrible. The problem in New York is Eli Manning. He's not good. It's 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 over. He's in that last year that Peyton had territory. Like it's it's done. And so people coming out and ripping Odell Beckham for just being honest, taking his uh histrionics down a notch on the sidelines, expressing his frustration to the teammates and everything inside the locker room, keeping it in house. I think everybody that's getting on him regarding this is full of crap and are a little bit all on their high horse. and need to be knocked down a peg. They need to do better. Yeah. I was curious of if it was just the media digging you know, for a story to on this. That's how it felt. They're mad that they asked him a question about Eli Manning and that he didn't give the right answer from what the media expected. Again, this is a lot like what we went through this offseason with uh, the national media. Just wanting a story to be true so badly that they'll go out there and try to drum up anything they can to support the narrative that they just want to pitch. The New York media seems to want friction between Odell and Eli. And so this is a way to generate that. It, It definitely feels that way. And they know that Odell causing controversy gets a lot of clicks. Sure. And that's really what it what it all boils down to. All right. Well, my do better this week is for response to robocalls. I, I've talked a little bit about this before, my issue mm. with robocalls. And I saw a report out that, uh, you know, that we're going to New York here. The New York Attorney General issued a press release saying that uh, 35 attorneys general throughout the United States, they filed a bipartisan complaint with the FCC saying that uh, they these these robocalls need to stop. And I saw that and I thought 35. Mm-hmm. Like we have we have more states than 35. 
Yeah, how, how are we not at 50? Or 51, because District of Columbia joined in on this as well. Here, Don't here's me who, with your facts, logic, and reason. <laughs> <laughs> here's who joined in. So if I call, if I don't call your state, then, then you know you have a call to make to your attorney general on this. Yes. Pennsylvania, Arizona, Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, D.C., Florida, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Mississippi, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Rhode Island, Tennessee, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, Wisconsin, and Hawaii. So so there's your attorney generals here. California, not on there. What's going on? I know yeah. we have some flockers there. That's messed up. That Texas, is messed up. Texas, not on there. Yeah, Texas does its own thing. <laughs> but, you know. So there you go. Now, this should be unanimous. The, the yes. robocalls are out of control. So for any states that didn't get on this, do better. Yeah, for sure, man. There's some there's some derelict on duties uh, attorney generals out there. What 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 better thing did they have to do that they couldn't just sign on to this? How hard I don't know, is attorney it? attorney general things apparently? <laughs> you know, I, I imagine attorney generals are busy. I there there is this uh, uh, election coming up. Yeah, so they might be busy. I with guess that. there's that. I guess there's that. But still, do better. <laughs> it's about how this affects me. I'm tired of I like to answer the phone when somebody calls and allowing it to go to, to voicemail just is uh, against my nature. And so I, I struggle with this. I love I love that uh, you're starting to get to a point in life to where it's like, this is how it affects me. <laughs> and this is what it's about. And I like that in you. I like seeing a little uh, just a little bit of selfish pop little, out. This yeah. is good. OK. All right, man. My better at life than Skip Bayless this week is for the Hubble telescope. Hooray, now, science. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, look, it's this is this is where I get to nerd out about this stuff and you guys have to listen. So tough break. Uh, the Hubble telescope has been in service for a long, long time at this point and has done so uh, with a pretty good record. Once they, you know, fix the little lens issue that they had, you know, mm-hmm. when they shot up a corrective lens in a shuttle and mounted it on there. Recently, they have had a couple more failures of gyroscopes on the on the Hubble Space Telescope. And you need three to really lock in where you're pointing and be able to like hold it there and see things for like a long period of time. The Hubble Space Telescope started out with six. It was down to three. And they just lost another one. Now, NASA's going to try to uh, restart one that had been on the fritz. But, uh, you know, it's not looking great. But they can still operate the thing with just one. And so they're going to take one offline if that doesn't work. Operate just the one. Just won't be quite as stable. But it's already gone two or three years past the service life that it was supposed to have with the last gyroscope upgrades. Mm-hmm. So still producing science, still producing amazing images. Think of all those amazing pictures you've seen from space that Hubble has provided. It's just been outstanding and for being able to grit it out and limp along with even just one last gyroscope, Hubble, better at life than Skip Bayless. <laughs> the inanimate Hubble telescope, better at life than Skip Bayless. You don't even have to have a beating heart to be better than Skip Bayless. You just have to be. <laughs> you just have to be. You have to provide some usefulness to humankind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it makes total sense. That's it. Well, my better at life this week is for the public servants taking care of our public lands on the Olympic Peninsula and protecting us from pea craved mountain goats, Adam. (laughs) I had seen the headline to this story, but had not uh, dove into it. Yes. Popular mechanics. The headline saying mountain goats are being airlifted out of National Park because they crave human pee. Part of the reason why this is a good thing is that if you are if you're in Olympic National Park taking a hike on the trail? Hey, if you've ever been hiking out in the woods, uh, you know what? There's not there's not restrooms. You know, you have to go Correct. somewhere. Yeah. And it turns out that mountain goats they aren't even a native species of Olympic National Park. So really, yeah, they were introduced back in 1920. Well, who was the genius that did that? I don't know. We did all kinds of things in the 20s. We stocked ponds with fish that weren't native, yeah, stocked rivers true. with fish that weren't native. So now, the, the, you know, a lot of our resource managers are having to, to combat that, you know, 100 years later. Right. And 
the number of mountain goats are up over 700 in the park. So it's a lot of mountain goats. Yeah. And especially when the problem is, is that they uh, want the salt and minerals from our urine. And right. so they're hanging out around the trails that we're you yeah. know trying to go for a walk. And the last thing that you need coming at you uh, when you're trying to relieve yourself on a trail is uh, a mountain goat. Well, uh, you, you're I, in a vulnerable state. Look, Brandon, I will give you a personal anecdote as to the dangers of mountain goats. So there was a time uh, that my dad and I had climbed up Great Northern Mountain, which is just outside of Glacier Park. It's a 10,000 foot peak. And when you get up towards the peak, it turns into like a razor thin uh, ledge that you walk on up to the peak. Like yeah. it's basically like a sidewalk wide uh, ribbon of rock that you walk and it's, you know, a couple thousand feet drop down either side. Yeah. Hiking up there and my dad, we came across a mountain goat and with two kids Ooh. and she was not excited and was being very aggressive and kind of bluff charging, you know, like kind of and backed us down the mountain, you know, to the point where I took the rifle off my back and was like, am I going to have to pop this thing? It was scary. Yeah. So for them to, it, with the, an intent in mind that these mountain goats have like some intent to like get these minerals, like they are scary out there. So this is probably a good thing. I, I think it is. And especially when you, you consider that they're and they're non-native to that area. So they're tagging, blindfolding and actually airlifting the goats over to the North Cascade side uh, via helicopter and trying to uh, put them in a, a more hospitable environment for them where they can with less pee with <laughs> where that, that now there will be less uh, pee, but there will also be less interaction with people. So that, that could be good for the goats, too. And for that yeah. park managers. Better at life than Skip Bayless. I like it. That was solid, man. Good job by you. <laughs> hey, when I see uh, uh, some talk about pee in a headline, I, yeah. you know I'm clicking. Tough to tough to resist, no doubt. You can't even call it clickbait because this is just good information. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't even made up. This is happening. All right, Adam. Well, we are hitting the road here to go to London. Yeah. Couldn't be more fired up. And this is going to be a this is going to be a fun weekend. Looking forward to seeing the stringers putting us up uh, on Friday night. Absolutely. Making dinner. Absolutely. Cooking breakfast is the plan. And then uh, hanging out with all our UK Seahawkers. And this is going to be a blast. It's going to be an absolute ball. I cannot wait. Everybody. Ah, yeah. Show up, man. If you're around, like show up. I want to see you. I know Brandon does, too. Let's blow this thing out. And let's make this feel like a home game environment for the Seahawks. Everybody complains about how Windley, oh, there's, you know, so many fans of all these different teams. Let's get them on our side and let's take mm-hmm. down these Oakland Raiders and let's, you know, meet up, get fired up before the game. Uh, Barrel Boy and Banker Pub is the Seahawks bar in London. We'll be there at some point. And Adam, with that, there's only one thing left to say Go Hawks! Go Hawks! Hey, look, a wireless caller from Sealy Lake, Montana. Oh, really? Is your warranty expired? <laughs> Probably. Or it's a limited enrollment period for healthcare. Oh, right. <laughs>